high Arctic, one of the most forbidding places on Earth. It's bitterly cold. In winter, the sun never appears above the horizon, and during the summer, it never sets. Even in these harsh surroundings, wildlife thrives. Each species is specially adapted to cope with this chilling environment. Offshore, the drifting pack ice is home to animals which find their food in the rich waters of the Arctic seas. But there's one animal which epitomizes life in the frozen north more than any other. It's at ease in the brutal cold, the unending winter darkness, and the grinding, crushing ice. It's the undisputed symbol of the north. The polar bear is the largest predator on land, an awesome combination of power and stealth as it stalks the edge of the ice at the top of the world. Early Arctic explorers were terrified of meeting a great white bear. They returned with horrifying stories of the animal's savagery. As more people ventured into the Arctic, the polar bear's reputation grew, but its ferocity was often wildly exaggerated. Large males, like this one, may be more than twice the weight of a lion or tiger. A polar bear is a force to be reckoned with, and in some situations, it can be extremely dangerous. The bear's true home is the Arctic ice pack, which forms a cap round the North Pole. The soles of its broad feet are furred to prevent them from freezing and slipping on ice. It's a powerful swimmer, too. It's been known to swim over a hundred miles from one ice floe to another. A thick layer of fat under its skin insulates it from the freezing cold. The polar bear is a magnificent example of an animal that is a total master of its environment.
Until recently, the great white bear was thought to roam tirelessly around the Arctic, its movements being governed by the drifting ice and ocean currents. Now, it's known that there are a number of groups which live largely separate from each other. To stay at the edge of the ice and their hunting grounds, most polar bears move south in winter as the ocean freezes and north in summer when it melts. They live within the territories of five nations. They're found in the United States, off the north and northwest coast of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, which is closely tied to Denmark, and the Svalbard Islands, which are under Norwegian and Russian rule. The polar bear's chief prey are seals. Without these marine mammals, it could not survive. In summer, it uses its excellent sense of smell to find bearded, hooded, and harp seals. When seals are plentiful, a bear normally kills one every few days. But not every stalk is successful. During the early spring, polar bears prey extensively on young ring seals. The pups are born in chambers under the snow. Bears are quick to scent out these birth layers and dig out the occupants. When a bear kills a seal, it often only eats the blubber. Seabirds and Arctic foxes scavenge the rest. The Arctic fox is the polar bear's jackal. Many follow the bears far out onto the ice and probably rely on them exclusively for their livelihood. Though seals form the bear's main prey, they are capable of killing much larger creatures. The bear's approach panics the walrus herd into the water. In the headlong rush to safety, the calves make it left behind. <laughs> Polar bears are incredibly strong and can hook a 500-pound seal out of the water onto the ice with a single swipe. During midwinter, polar bears live in a world of twilight and darkness, but they continue hunting, relying on scent and light reflection from the snow to guide them. They also dig temporary shelters to escape the worst of the winter blizzards. While most bears spend the winter roaming the pack ice, the majority of pregnant females move back to land where they dig snow dens in preparation for the birth of cubs in December and January. Dens are usually found on the leeward side of cliffs and valleys where the snow cover is deepest. Early in the new year, the sun once again appears above the horizon. 
During the weeks of darkness, the mother polar bear has remained in her den, suckling her newborn cubs. But as the hours of daylight lengthen and more light filters through the snow, she becomes increasingly active. Finally, in March or early April, the day comes when she decides it's time to emerge. And soon after, she calls out her cubs. Despite her long winter fast, the female doesn't begin searching for food immediately. For a week or more, she continues to use the winter den as her base. It gives the cubs a chance to accustom themselves to the outside world and gain strength through their explorations and play. She often excavates hollows nearby where she suckles her young. Polar bears give birth to between one and three cubs, but twins are the most common number. Finally, the time comes when the mother bear decides to leave the den site for good. She's eager to head out to the ice where she can hunt seals. And now the cubs are strong enough to make the journey. The bear's departure leaves the den site free for inspection. It's in a typical spot, a snowbank where the female excavated a tunnel several yards long. Those furrows on the ceiling show where the bear clawed away more snow during her confinement. At the end of the tunnel lies the chamber where in midwinter she gave birth to her tiny blind cubs. Most females den on land and the family may have to trek several miles to reach the ceiling grounds out on the ice. The mother is very hungry now, but she must temper her eagerness for prey, for the cubs still can't travel very fast. Every so often, she has to stop to give them a rest and a chance to suckle. Hunger soon has the family on the move again. The bears normally reach the ice within a day or so of leaving the den. They're heading for the area of active ice. Its most distinctive feature is the shear zone, the transition point between shore fast ice joined to the land and the moving ice beyond. Here, vertical ridges of ice may extend for miles parallel to the shore. During autumn, 
When the drifting ice offshore begins to freeze, powerful ocean currents temporarily separate the floating ice pack from the solid ice inshore. The action of currents and wind exert forces which produce pressure ridges, enormous walls of jumbled ice which can be over 50 feet high. The movements of the ice also produce stretches of open water called leads. Off the north coast of Alaska, they're the favorite haunt of seals. In the spring, they form an important hunting ground for polar bears. Alaska's coast and offshore waters are the home of several thousand bears. Part of this population is being closely monitored by wildlife authorities. In spring and autumn, when the bears are hunting seals relatively close inshore, it's possible to locate them from a helicopter. The polar bear research program in Alaska includes tagging and marking bears in order to study their movements. The only safe way to get close to a polar bear is to tranquilize it. A large male may weigh over a thousand pounds and can easily kill a man. When the team is confident the bear is fully sedated, they give him a routine penicillin injection. Numbered tags are placed in the bear's ears. Made of durable plastic, they're a permanent means of future identification and won't harm the bear. As a further permanent record, the inside of the upper lip is inscribed with a tattoo. Painting a serial number on the bear serves for long distance recognition. It's only a temporary measure. In the coming months, the bear will shed and the number will gradually be lost. Polar bears are so heavy, the easiest way to lift and weigh them is from a helicopter.
A small sample of blood is taken for analysis. Then the bear is injected with an antidote to revive it. Recovery is remarkably sudden. But things can go wrong. When this adult female was darted, no one realized she had unexpected company. Spring is the polar bear's mating time. This huge male may have been following the female for days, and he's not about to give up. I think he's coming. Large males aren't easily scared. They're as likely to attack as run away, particularly when there's a female at stake. Steve, get back. One of the team signals to start the helicopter engines. Suddenly, it's turned into a very dangerous situation. The team needs to finish working on the darted female as soon as possible, but the male won't back off. In his agitated state, he's highly unpredictable and potentially a real threat. The main hope now is that the noise of the helicopter will frighten him away. It works. A deadly encounter avoided. In situations like this, it's easy to see how the polar bear acquired its fearsome reputation. Fortunately, polar bears rarely encounter humans. Few people venture into their world of ice and snow. Several thousand miles to the east of Alaska, the Svalbard Islands lie within the realm of the great white bear. Eastern Svalbard is barren but the offshore waters are fed by the cold currents of the Barents Sea and are rich in marine life. This area provides prime habitat for seals and therefore bears. During the summer months, when the pack ice breaks up, the bears spend considerable time in the water as they travel around their hunting grounds. Some become landlocked, hunting seals deep in the fjords and inlets where patches of solid ice remain. <laughs> Western Svalbard is less harsh. Here the coast is bathed by warm transatlantic currents. Wildlife can survive more easily here including animals like the small Svalbard reindeer, a subspecies unique to these islands. Bird life is abundant. In summer, little auks nest in colonies on the inland cliffs and scree slopes. Western Svalbard also has a more diverse flora, including a number of flowering plants at the northerly limit of their range. A 
Until recently, polar bears were hunted for their coats. In Svalbard alone, an average of over 300 were taken annually. Many were killed with a set gun. The bear shot itself, pulling on a bait attached to the trigger. The evidence can still be seen, but in 1973, polar bear hunting in Svalbard was outlawed. Today, Norwegian scientists visit these waters in summer to study the rich and abundant offshore wildlife, including the polar bear. The Barents Sea now contains one of the highest populations of polar bears in the world. Knowledge of their movements is important if future management and conservation is to be effective. Catching and fitting bears with radio collars is the best way of following their travels. Landing a helicopter on the unstable summer ice is too dangerous. Every effort is made to tranquilize the bear as quickly as possible to avoid exhausting it during a long chase. The bear is hit, but hardly notices. It's vitally important the researchers don't lose track of the bear among the maze of ice flows. If it loses consciousness in the water, it could drown, so it's chased back onto the ice. The team must be certain it's really unconscious before they get too close. Scientific checks are carried out on board ship, and a specially constructed cage is used to hoist the bear onto the deck. This shoulder harness has been designed to carry a prototype collar containing a satellite transmitter. Okay, <coughs> 
With the harness and collar in place, the bear is left alone until it comes to. Despite its reputation, most polar bears are not the ferocious man-killers described in stories of old. The bear will stay in the cage for 24 hours so that the researchers can make absolutely sure the collar fits and is working properly. By the following day, the bear is fully recovered. It's ready to get back onto the ice, and the team is satisfied that the collar and harness aren't going to harm the bear. It will wear its collar for a year. Then the harness is designed to break and fall off. In the meantime, it will transmit signals which are bounced by satellite to a receiver in France and then relayed to computers in Oslo. Tracking polar bears by satellite, if successful, will enable researchers to follow their movements in places where it's impossible to follow with a conventional radio. Though polar bears are typically animals of the far north, in some areas they live well to the south of the Arctic Circle. Hudson Bay in Canada is almost on the same latitude as London, yet a resident population of polar bears lives here. During the summer months, as the ice melts, the bears are forced to move ashore. On land, they have to rely on their fat reserves. There are no seals to hunt. They eat roots, bulbs, even bird's eggs and small mammals when they can, but often survive months without a substantial meal. To save energy, they're relatively inactive while on land. Polar bears are normally solitary creatures, but in Hudson Bay, they're found living close together. In autumn, groups head towards areas like Cape Churchill to await the first freeze-up of the winter ice. In situations like this, the largest bears are usually dominant.
but there's little real aggression. Younger bears know their place, and the fights are not serious. It's very unusual to see polar bears behaving like this. But while they are landlocked and waiting for the sea to freeze, they have plenty of time to spar. These bears are simply testing each other's strength. During the mating season, in spring, the battles between rival males become deadly. With the summer influx of other bears, mothers with cubs tend to retreat inland. Adult males sometimes kill small cubs. Polar bears born on this coast experience a very different world from their counterparts in the frozen north. But even here, ice is a natural attraction. After several months of living on land, the bear's coats become dirty and matted. But with the return of the ice and snow, they'll soon turn white again. Although Hudson Bay's coastline is far from the typical setting for polar bears, it suits them remarkably well. Females here produce and raise triplets more frequently than anywhere else. The cubs often become independent of their mothers before they're two years old, several months earlier than is normal in the more rigorous conditions of the Arctic. These cubs are in their first year, and they're still entirely dependent on their mother for food.
In Hudson Bay, bears often scavenge along the shoreline. As autumn progresses, more and more assemble at Cape Churchill and other promontories to wait for the sea to freeze. The bears make for the headlands and sheltered bays where the sea freezes first. They're eager to get out onto the ice to hunt seals. They're impatient, but have to wait until the ice is thick enough to hold their weight. Eventually, the time comes when the bay is frozen solid. Then, within a matter of days, the bears leave the land for their hunting grounds. Only pregnant females remain to await the birth of cubs in their maternity dens. Hudson Bay is unusual. In most of the polar bears' range, they live far to the north of human settlements. The only humans they're likely to meet are the indigenous peoples of Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. They regard the polar bear as an important part of their heritage. They've long prized the bear's magnificent creamy white pelt for its warmth and its meat for food. In modern times, mechanized hunting of polar bears, both commercially and for sport, has had a serious impact in some parts of their range.
Overhunting is largely a thing of the past, but polar bears now face a greater threat. Petroleum exploration and development is firmly established in the Arctic. Prudhoe Bay, an oil field on the northern coast of Alaska, is an example. What began as development in a limited coastal area has now spread in all directions. The main pipeline from Prudhoe Bay runs for almost a thousand miles to Alaska's southern coast. Oil exploration isn't confined to onshore regions. Offshore drilling and seismic testing pose new threats to the bears, to the areas they use for denning, and to their main prey species, the seals. It would be disastrous if a major oil spill occurred offshore under the ice. Wildlife authorities in Alaska are aware of these problems, so it's important that scientists quickly gain a better understanding of how the bears could be affected. This necessitates studying not only the bears themselves, but animals like seals on which they prey. The polar bear, at the top of the food chain, is only one in a long line of creatures which would suffer from the environmental changes that development of the Arctic could cause. Alaska's bears represent only a percentage of the total population. It's currently estimated that between 20 and 40,000 polar bears are spread across the top of the globe. Their conservation is an international concern. In 1972, the five polar bear nations negotiated a treaty for the further preservation of this unique predator. Thanks to this remarkable international effort, polar bear populations are now stable, and some are even on the increase again. With help, the polar bear may continue its reign as the symbol of one of the last great wildernesses on Earth.